Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, on the 19th of October, the Holy Church commemorates the Holy Prophet Joel. The glorious prophet Joel, son of Bethuel, Pethuel, was from the tribe of Reuben. He hailed from Bethormoron, and the common Jewish name Joel, theologically significant considering its etymology, is interpreted variously as love of God, first fruits of God, Yahweh is God, J is God, or whose God is Jehovah. Nothing is known of the life or circumstances of this prophet. In his objective manner when speaking of the priesthood, he does not reveal if he himself is a priest. He is placed fourth in the Greek Septuagint. In Orthodox iconography, Prophet Joel, a divinely inspired man of unquestionable faith, is depicted in Byzantine domes with long, wavy, dark hair and a medium, curly, dark beard separating into two points. He is of medium build, with regular facial features and a kindly aspect. The scroll he usually holds bears this inscription, The Lord shall cry out of Zion, and shall utter his voice from Jerusalem. The great Synaxeristes reports that upon his repose he was buried in his own country. The Evidence for Dating References to Tyre, Sidon, Philistia, and the Greeks are too vague to furnish a reliable date for the composition of his prophecy. There is no mention of a king, but the influence of the priesthood appears to be prominent. The temple was still standing and fully operable. The walls of Jerusalem were also still standing. His book thus was traditionally has traditionally been dated to 835 BC. The enemies of Judah that are mentioned are not those of the exilic age, such as Babylon and Chaldea, but rather Philistia and Phoenicia, and Egypt and Idumea, most of whom came into conflict with Judah in some manner in pre-exilic days. Therefore, the date of his prophecy is greatly disputed, and the difficulties of dating are not simplified by his literary style, which is marked by striking rhythms, descriptive figures of speech, the use of repetition to heighten expressions, and his drawing of parallels between similar situations. He has a vivid style conspicuous for its beauty of expression, and his work is considered to be one of the most polished of the prophetic writings. Many place the book in the minority of King Joas at a time when Jehoda, the high priest, was regent in Judah. Alexander Mavrocordatos, in his Judaica Identities, the prophet, as having flourished during the years of the kings of the southern kingdom of Judah, namely Ozias, Joatham, Akaz, and Ezekias, and the king of the northern kingdom of Israel, Jeroboam II. <clears throat> Cleems, the canonist, believes that the prophet Joel was a contemporary of prophet Amos, the prophet's message. The prophet Joel prophesied about a future famine among the Jews, the disappearance of the temple offerings, and the passion of the righteous one, through which all the universe might be renewed to salvation. His prophetic book consists of three chapters. In the second chapter, he proclaims the good tidings of the incarnation of God the Logos, the descent of the Holy Spirit, the saving passion, the second coming, and the glory of the church. He warns the people that their sins would warrant their captivity in Babylon. The prophet called the people to sanctify a fast, and the priests to penitent and tearful prayer, 
so as to invoke divine mercy. We also learn from the prophet Joel about God's providence for us and how he directs all things. He tells us of his long-suffering and mercy, of his justice and judgment, and of his munificence. We hear that he alone is God, and that he calls us to true prayer and repentance. We are told to call upon him. When we remain unrepentant, we shall be judged. We learn how God would pour out of his Spirit upon his sons and daughters and that he would manifest himself with portents. He will gather the Gentiles and bring them into the valley of Josaphat. Prophet Joel teaches us what is a proper fast. Sanctify a fast, proclaim a solemn service, gather the elders and all the inhabitants of the land into the house of your God, and cry earnestly to the Lord. St. John Chrysostom writes, Hear how the prophet bade them to fast. Sanctify a fast, he said. He did not say, Make a parade of your fasting, but call an assembly, gather together the ancients. St. Gregory the Great, the diologist, writes that, When it is said by the prophet, sanctify a fast, sanctifying a fast means showing bodily fasting to God as alms by adding every other good deed. Cease to be angry. Put aside quarrels. You weaken your body in vain if you do not restrain your heart from all its pleasures. Speaking on the Incarnation and where the Logos would appear, the prophet writes, And the Lord shall cry out of Zion, and shall utter his voice from Jerusalem, and the heaven and the earth shall be shaken. But the Lord shall spare his people, and shall strengthen the children of Israel. St. Irenaeus Bishop of Lyons explains that the prophet Joel specified the place of his advent. The Lord shall cry out of Zion, and shall utter his voice from Jerusalem, and that it is from that region, which is toward the south of the inheritance of Judah, that the Son of God shall come. Who is God, and who was from Bethlehem, where the Lord was born, and will send out his praise through all the earth? St. Chrysostom says that the prophet Joel predicted salvation through faith, for he did not remain silent on this when he said, And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Elsewhere he comments, Everyone who shall invoke, says the prophet, but not in just any manner, for it is written, Not everyone who saith to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of the heavens, but the one who doeth the will of my Father in the heavens. What is meant is that the one who calls does so with inward, earnest affection, with a life more than commonly good, with the confidence which is meet. In another prophecy, the sacred droll speaks of the gifts of the Holy Spirit after Christ's ascension. For it is written, Thou didst ascend on high, thou didst lead captivity captive, thou didst receive gifts for men. The prophet Joel prophesied, And it shall come to pass afterward, that I will pour out of my Spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. And of your old men shall dream dreams, and your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions. St. Kirill of Jerusalem, patriarch from 349, saints, cites this verse as one of many testimonies concerning the Holy Spirit. This expression, I will pour out, implied a rich gift, 
for God giveth not the Spirit by measure. For the Father loveth the Son, and hath given all things into his hand. And he has given him the power also of bestowing the grace of the Holy Spirit on whomsoever he will, on my servants and on my handmaids. In those days will I pour out of my Spirit. The Holy Spirit is no respecter of persons, for he seeks not dignities, but piety of soul. Let neither the rich be puffed up, nor the poor dejected, but only let each prepare himself for reception of the heavenly gift. St. Gregory the Theologian declares that the Holy Spirit came after Christ, that a comforter should not be lacking unto us. The descent of the Holy Spirit was proclaimed by the prophets, and he was promised by the mouth of Joel first, who said, And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my Spirit upon all flesh, that is, upon all that believe, and upon your sons and your daughters, and the rest. And then afterward he was promised by Jesus, being glorified by him, and giving back glory to him, as he was glorified by and glorified the Father. And how abundant was this promise! He shall abide forever, and shall remain with you, whether now with those who in the sphere of time are worthy, or hereafter with those who are counted worthy of that world, when we have kept him altogether by our life here, and not rejected him in so far as we sin. St. Ambrose also impresses upon us that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are one in counsel. The Holy Spirit himself is power or might, and that we may know more completely that the Spirit is power, we ought to know that he was promised when the Lord said, I will pour out of my Spirit upon all flesh. He then who was promised to us is himself power. As in the gospel, the same Son of God declared when he said, And behold, I send forth the promise of my Father upon you. But sojourn in the city of Jerusalem until ye are clothed with power from on high. And the evangelist so far shows that the Spirit is power, that St. Luke relate, relates that he came down with great power when he says, and suddenly there came to be a sound out of the heaven, like as of a violent wind borne along, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. We read unmistakably the fulfillment of this prophecy in the New Testament and how it came to pass on Pentecost Day. While the day of Pentecost was being fulfilled, the faithful were all with one accord in the same place. And suddenly there came to be a sound out of the heaven, and there appeared to them tongues as if of fire being distributed, and it sat upon each one of them. The venerable Bede, in a homily on the Acts of the Apostles, writes, The word effusion, pouring out, shows the lavishness of the gift. For the grace of the Holy Spirit was not to be granted, as formerly, only to individual prophets and priests, but to everyone, in every place, regardless of sex, state of life, or position. The prophet subsequently explains what all flesh means, saying, Your sons and daughters shall prophesy, and so forth. St. Gregory Palamas, Archbishop of Thessalonica, explains that there are three realities in God, namely essence, energy, and a trinity of div divine hypostases. Those deemed worthy of union with God so as to become one spirit with him, even as the great Paul has said, he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit, are not united to God in essence. And since all theologians bear witness in their statements to the fact that God is imparticipable in essence and the hypostatic union 
happens to be predicted of the Logos and God-man alone. It follows that those deemed worthy of union with God are united to God in energy, and that the Spirit whereby he who clings to God is one with God, is called and is indeed the uncreated energy of the Spirit, and not the essence of God. For God foretold through the prophet, not my spirit, but rather I will pour out of my spirit upon those who believe. Prophet Joel also predicted signs to be fulfilled in nature. The venerable Bede makes mention of the prophet Joel's words, I will show wonders in the heaven above, and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and vapor of smoke, and explains prodigies in heaven when with the Lord's birth a new star appeared, and with his ascending of the cross the sun was dimmed, and heaven itself was covered with darkness. Signs on the earth when with the Lord's breathing forth of his spirit it, the earth, trembled violently broke open sepulchres, split apart rocks, and brought forth alive again the bodies of many of the saints who had fallen asleep. Blood and fire and vapor of smoke, the blood of the Lord's side, the fire of the Holy Spirit, the vapor of compunction and tears, because just as smoke is produced from fire, so vapor is produced from the ardor of the Holy Spirit. And as for blood flowing in a vigorous stream from the Lord's dead flesh, because this is contrary to the nature of our bodies, it remains for us to believe that this was done for a sign, a sign of what, to be sure, if not of our salvation and the life which is born from his death. It is also possible to understand the fire as the enlightening of the faithful, and the vapor of smoke as the blindness of the Jews who did not believe. Whence also, when about to give the law, the Lord descended in fire and smoke, because through the brilliance of his manifestation he enlightened the humble, and through the murky smoke of error he dimmed the eyes of the proud. The venerable Bede adds, Behold the fulfillment of the prophecy of Joel. Notice that after the fire of the Holy Spirit, there followed the vapor of compunction. For smoke tends to cause tears. Those who had laughed in ridicule begin to weep. They beat their breasts. They present their prayer to God as a sacrifice, so that as people who are to be saved, they may be able to taste of that blood which before, when they were damned, they had called down upon themselves and their children. And in that day about three thousand souls were added. The Sunday after the Nativity of our Lord Jesus Christ, we sing, Blood and fire and clouds of smoke are the wonders which Joel foresaw on earth. The blood is the incarnation, the fire is the divinity, the clouds of smoke are the Holy Spirit, who descended upon the Virgin and hath made the world fragrant. Great is the mystery of thine incarnation, O Lord, glory to thee. This prophet also speaks of the end times. Saint Basil asserts, the Lord has already foretold that the signs of the disillusion of the universe will appear in the sun and moon and stars. The sun shall be turned into darkness, and the moon into blood. These are the signs of the consummation of the world. St. Chrysostom comments that, By the great and notable day of the Lord, he meant both the day of the Spirit, Pentecost, and the day which would come at the consummation of the world. The Venerable Bede adds, This is partly believed as something which had been done at the Lord's Passion, and partly as something to be done in the future. 
before the great day of the Lord, that is, the day of judgment. The prophet Joel writes that the day of the Lord is great, exceedingly manifest, and who is sufficient to resist it? St. Basil the Great speaks here, What is this day of the Lord to you? Whereas it is darkness and not light, but darkness certainly for those who are deserving of darkness. For this day without evening, without succession, and without end, is not unknown to Scripture. It is the day which the psalmist called the eighth, because it lies outside this time of weeks. Therefore, whether you say day or age, you will express the same idea. If, then, that condition should be called day, it is one and not many, or, if it should be named age, it would be unique and not manifold. Speaking on the future judgment, the prophet writes, For behold, in those days and at that time, when I shall have turned the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem, I will also gather all the nations and bring them down to the valley of Josaphat, and will plead with them there for my people and my heritage Israel, who have been dispersed among the nations. And... Let them be aroused. Let all the nations go up to the valley of Josaphat, for there will I sit to judge all the Gentiles round about. Through the prayers of the holy prophet Joel, Lord Jesus Christ our God, have mercy on us.